going to move on now back to constitutive modeling. So in the last time we had lecture, by the way, uh, did anyone show up for class Tuesday? You did? Yeah, you didn't check your email? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I was actually here, but uh, you know I, I didn't even walk down here. So anyway, uh, so the last time we had class was quite some time ago because the class was canceled Tuesday. We had to test Thursday, and so the last time was a a week ago. And if you can remember back that far, we looked at uh, constitutive models. So re you know the relationship between stress and strain for uh, rock. And in that case, the relationship between stress and strain, and we define strain mathematically. We've been talking a lot about stress. And in that case, what we covered was basically the three-dimensional version of this, right? The linear elasticity. So stress versus strain, where you have a linear elastic response, OK? And in doing that, or what we haven't talked about, is the effect of the fluid in the rock, right? There, there's, there is fluid in the rock. So, so the linear elasticity that we covered last time basically is an adequate constitutive response for very small strains in a dry rock, right? where the fluid pressure well, is, is non-existent, OK? But in, what we care about, there's a fluid pressure in the rock, and that affects the overall response of the rock. And so we're going to talk a little bit about today about how that happens. So there's a couple of assumptions that we make in poor elasticity. And the first is that there's an interconnected pore system. So if we Look at a piece of rock that we know has pores in it. Okay. We assume that these pores are interconnected. So basically, the idea is that they're little channels that connect every pore such that fluid can flow between them. Okay, that's assumption one. And so then the second assumption is that the total volume of the pore system is small compared to the volume of the rock. So in other words, if we look at the volume of the rock and then we add up the total volume of the pores, that ratio should be, I'm sorry, that ratio should be much less than 1. OK. And the pore pressure, the total stress acting on the rock externally, so that's, that's our far field stress. So this is our external stress. We have a pore pressure inside. So this is pore pressure. And the stress acting on the grains. So, what we mean by grains is that if you if you were to imagine that, because we 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 made the assumption that all the pores are interconnected, then these guys would be the grains, right? The individual constituents of the rock itself, uh, that the stresses acting on those are statistically defined. So 
that's just a fancy way to say that we, we're looking at, we're assuming averages here, okay? So we obviously there are small fluctuations in the pore pressure from pore to pore, okay? There are small fluctuations in the stress from grain to grain, and there are small fluctuations in the external stress on the outside, but we assume that they're, we, we look at them in an average sense. So we look at the mean of all of those small fluctuations, okay, or, or that's the assumption we make, okay? And so we've already been talking about effective stress with this equation, and we haven't given it a name. Essentially, we just call it the effective stress. And uh, I'm sorry, I should this this should be uh, I'll fix it later. I should have some indication that this is the effective stress. Okay. So this definition of effective stress that we've been using was first introduced by a guy named Ter Terzaghi. And so we call that the Terzaghi effective stress. But it turns out that there's a, there's a better approximation to the effective stress. You might call that the exact effective stress. And it has this definition. Okay. So again, this should be when I, I'll correct the notes to, to indicate that, you know, sometimes we use a, a tick or double tick there, and then I should be consistent with my notation, so this should also be an S. The main difference between these two equations is this alpha, okay? So this alpha is something that we call Bio's coefficient, okay? And 